my name is Russ Herman. Uh, currently a high school teacher up in Wisconsin. I am the academic director at STEM 101 and have a relationship with Jordan and the NASCO team, uh, which is also located in Wisconsin, uh, one of their branches. So uh, the topic today is really starting to talk STEM and engineering and how we can create these thinkers, doers, and problem solvers, specifically uh, the grades eight to 10. There will be additional webinars at some point that'll cover some of the lower grade levels, middle school, as well as upper high school level. So right now the focus would be more of an introductory to engineering at the uh, higher end of middle school, lower end of high school. So that is that is our audience that we're trying to capture, the students that we would try to create into thinkers, doers, and problem solvers. So that being said, I'd like to just cover a little bit of what we're gonna try to take care of today in this short webinar. First of all, what really makes a STEM activity a STEM activity? Some of the characteristics, we'll get into that. There's six of them, at least in my opinion, there's six characteristics that make a good STEM activity. So we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit. Really the purpose is how are we going to create the thinkers, doers, and problem solvers? And then we'll go through a series of different projects and activities, discuss, I'll show examples, samples, pictures, and hopefully give you a good feel and, and understanding of what some of the the content and activities that we use not only in my high school but uh, across the country in in the SEM 101 curriculum and then of course at the end questions and contact information before I move um, my question to anyone listening is what do you folks currently use as far as STEM slash engineering curriculum? Do you grow your own? Do you have any? Are you looking for STEM or engineering content and curriculum? Just trying to gauge and, and pull as to where we're at as an audience. So uh, Jordan will be sending a poll out to you folks that you'll have time to, to answer a couple questions on that. So moving ahead, really it's, a STEM activity, in my opinion, and that doesn't mean it's worth a whole lot, but I've, I've been a teacher up in Wisconsin for 25 years, started using and infusing engineering curriculum and STEM curriculum for the last 12 years and developed what I think works pretty well. So the six characteristics, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on any one of these, just throwing six characteristics out there for you. So first of all, I think a good STEM lesson or activity is gonna have some real world questions, concerns, focus, issues at hand, the problems that might come up in the real world. So that is one of the, the six that I think is important. Uh, one of the more important in my opinion, and we'll get into this when we talk about some of the different projects and activities that I'm gonna go through in the webinar, but whatever your design process is, and I'm assuming it is either a very direct and specific process that students follow, or it just naturally happens. But I just threw a bunch of images up here, not that you need to take notes on any one of these, but everyone has their design process. And the one that I have in, in the middle, the design process is just the one that we've adopted at my school. That's one right here, but uh, some of the other ones are just what do you use? Uh, some schools use the design process from NASA, some created and built their own. The biggest takeaway is the kids love projects. They love a table full of goodies and they get to build things and, and construct and glue and screw and break and all that other good stuff, which is important, but there's a lot of things that can happen on the front end of that activity and a lot of things that have to happen after they do the building. So. We'll get into more of that and you'll see that in some of the examples. Uh, getting students the hands-on experience. There's a lot of students that go through high school, middle school, elementary school that have not as many hands-on opportunities as they could or should. So a STEM lesson obviously is gonna have a whole bunch of 
hands-on uh, experiences for students. So keep that in mind as we go through this webinar, you'll see all the activities and samples that I'll have are hands-on based. Working in a team is always important. Two, three, four heads are better than one. Uh, causes conflict once in a while. As anyone that's worked uh, their students in teams, you know that there's it doesn't always work out perfect, but in the end, typically the solution is better than just one student trying to work through a problem. So I think a good team is important. And then, of course, we want to apply the math and the science, the English, and all the other core academics and apply that to the real world hands on project. And that's a challenge once in a while for students that aren't the, they're smart and they know the math and they know the science, but then trying to apply that to a, a hands on project is sometimes difficult for students. So, at some degree, it's good for the students to, to have that connection. And then, of course, no one likes to fail, and everyone wants just one right answer, but I think the biggest takeaway in a STEM lesson is it's okay to have multiple ideas and multiple answers and multiple solutions, and that failing and going back and reworking and learning from that failure is really what's going to make that team and that project and activity successful. So those are what I would consider six good quality uh, characteristics of a STEM lesson. Does every activity and project have to have all six of those? I, I think they do, but I think indirectly they will anyway. Creating thinkers, doers, problem solvers. That's what this presentation and webinar is about. So how are we going to do that? So the next slides that we're going to go through really is you have the project, we need to go beyond that. I think it's important that students understand that, yes, they're going to get a table or a, a bunch of supplies and they're going to have to build something, but there's more to it than just the project. And we'll see some examples of that as we go through. Following a design process, one of the six characteristics of a good STEM lesson, I think it is super important that the students work through a process and not just go to that table and start building and and gluing and screwing and putting things together without a solid thought before they start building and a, a good plan before they start constructing. So following a process I think is very important and we'll see that as we move through this. And then simply just developing skills, whether it's hands-on, uh, applying the math and the science, just developing a good set of skills as they're working through a project. And then those three things right there, I truly feel is what's going to make students better and a quality project incorporating all this is going to help students as they move through middle school, high school. All right. So as we dive into all the activities, what my challenge to you is, as you sit and get and look at this, some of these activities, what would you do better than what I'm going to show you? What would you do different? How would you make any changes? What kind of changes would that be? What would you add? What would you get rid of? What would you delete? What do you like? What don't you like? What's going to make your students ultimately better problem solvers and be able to work through a process and have a good quality solution when they get done, whatever that activity is. So those are the things that I'm gonna uh, try to have you keep in the back of your mind as we move into some of these projects. So the course that I'm going to reference, all of the projects following this slide right here is based off a course that we use in my high school and STEM 101's developed is an introduction to engineering. So I'm just going to, this is a learning management system. Everyone's familiar with learning management systems, especially in today's uh, pandemic. But 
this is just an online platform. We'll get into more of this. I'll be going back to every every one of the slides and projects that we go through will have. Uh, I'll be going back to this. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It's just this is where my information is coming from, and I'll review this at the end. So the next set of slides are really the projects and activities. So as we go through this, you'll just see a lot of different activities, most of them completely different from the other. So I'm just going to kind of go through this. There's no set order here. It's not, this isn't what I would do first or anything like that, but here's just one project. So there's a unit that we use is what is engineering and engineering jobs that um, a typical engineer might do, not necessarily the specific discipline. So one of the activities in there is the stress analysis, which is really data collection. So I'm going to come back to this slide in a second. I'm just going to jump into the the learning management system, and and there is a unit called what is engineering. So what does this look like? Um, we can get into the details of this, but really what I want to go to is the the actual activity in here. So this activity is all the information that a student's going to do. And I don't expect anyone to read through this and look at this. Just this is the instructions and what the students are directed to do. So you can see what they're going to do through here. So I'm just going to scroll down here. Uh, long story short, students are going to either be walking on a track. They're going to be going up and down stairs. They're going to walk around a block. They're going to walk around the hallways, whatever. We're really just trying to look at a heart rate. When a student is at rest, a heart rate when they're walking with a backpack, without a backpack, a backpack, a little bit late or speed walking. And the only purpose of this is for students to think like engineers and understand what engineering is in the sense of they're going to collect data. They're going to uh, analyze that data. They're going to do the testing because they're walking and, and collecting their heart rate. So it's really more of a data collection and what you do with that data, which is the important part. So we know the heart rate of any one typical uh, human is going to increase their heart rate as an activity gets a little more rigorous. So at rest heart rate, have the discussion of 60 to 85 is normal heart rate. So when you start walking with a backpack on, the heart rate's going to increase. This activity could be over if that's all the, the purpose of the activity was. So going back to this slide, in the upper right corner, we have some random names and their heartbeats. And then we take that data and can students chart this information in a spreadsheet. So my question that is, you don't have to answer this, but uh, maybe it's different in Wisconsin, but ninth grade students generally come into the high school with very little spreadsheet knowledge. They do a whole lot of computer and technology stuff before we get them in the high school. But for whatever reason, the spreadsheet, Google Sheets, whatever we're using isn't a strong suit for a lot of these students. So anyway, they're going to take this data that they've done with uh, the walking around the track stairs, chart it out. Is this Does this chart tell you anything? And if done correctly, it should tell most of the information that was up in the spreadsheet that has the numbers. And then here's another example down here as well. So Again, purpose is can we test, can we analyze, can we collect the data like an engineer does on a daily basis and do that through a fairly simple activity. So I'm going to pause for a little bit before I move to the next activity and see if there are any questions. And if not, then we will move to the next slide. Okay, uh, moving on. Another activity, uh, should back up just one. Uh, I'm not going to get into the specific times, 
and how long something like this would take, but this project here is probably, oh, by the time you do the activity and you give them time to work on the spreadsheet and collect that data and get it from other people, in hours wise, you're probably looking at three to four hours. Um, so a student, I'm gonna go back into this, a student will end up creating a report based off of this. So I'm just gonna show a quick example of what this would look like. Not a great example, but good enough to show. So this is a different student introduction, the data that was collected, um, bar graph that kind of tells me what I wanna know, a lot of bar graphs, uh, and then a reflection at the end. So if done right, a student should have all that information that they collected and they should be able to put it into a, a pretty decent technical report. All right, moving on. Structural engineering is very similar to civil engineering. So uh, there's, there's differences, but there are a lot of connections between structural and civil, and we'll get into the civil in a little bit. So the activity is a cantilever project. So I'm gonna go to the activity and then we'll come back to, back to that slide. So a student's expectation is to create a cantilever. First of all, they have to research what a cantilever is. And then what they're gonna do is get a series of uh, set of supplies, 10 sheets of copy paper, paper clips, tape, straw, and some mason line. And what they need to do is create a solution, a cantilever, that will hold an egg, golf ball, whatever you choose to use, as far out from the wall as possible. So you can kind of see some of these. Uh, you can either use the command hooks, the removable hooks, the 3M hooks that you can get or a cork board, whatever you want to use, but they're going to design a structure that's going to hold an egg or a golf ball out as far as possible. We try to say uh, an A is 60 inches or more, and that is very obtainable with that small amount of material. Let's go back to that design process. So students have to research what a cantilever is. They need to, as you can see in some of these images, they have to do some sketching, detailed sketches, not just a couple straight lines and then say, give me the paper and let me start building. They have to have some thought put behind it. And then they do their building and then that structure doesn't work the way they want it to work, which is very common. And then they have to go back and do some redesigning. If they redesign, they have to resketch, rethink, and then their new solution needs to look like the like the solution that's on the wall. So I'll go back to this. Um, there's some videos that talk about structural engineering, video about cantilever, um, grading rubric. There's all there's a lot of information. I, we also make students generate and collect the data and make sure they show the process that they followed, not just a picture of the image. So again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on, on a, what I call a technical report, but the data that they've collected and the documentation that they should include, which is, again, the process that I think every project should have. Not necessarily always a technical report, but proof of the process that they follow. All right, again, done with this one. I'm gonna wait a couple seconds. If there's any questions about this specific activity or the design process or anything, um, I can answer that at this time. Otherwise, in about 10 seconds, we'll move on. All right. Engineering communication, this is probably one of the, in my opinion, and many other teachers' opinions, an important 
unit and, a, and an important concept for students to understand. Orthographic projection. Kids, students uh, at most grade levels aren't super thrilled about orthographic projection because it's a little tougher to understand. It's, it's basically looking at this plastic block and trying to draw it in most often three different views, a front and a top and a right side view and be able to put the dimensions on there so that if I gave someone that drawing, another student or another person, that they'd be able to draw it, model it up so that it could be manufactured. So it's by far not the, the hands-on that a lot of students think of as hands-on, but super important that students understand how to create an orthographic projection or a multi-view drawing or a top front right side view. Every person calls it a little bit, uh, something a little bit different. So it's important. The reason I think it's important is it's how manufacturing and industry works. Things don't get made unless there's drawings that go with it. So we like to have students work through orthographic projection. One of the activities in there, so besides just making a whole lot of orthographic projection, uh, drawing blocks and modeling them up, so we'll make students hand sketch. I think it's important that they hand sketch. We use a 2D software. Every school, um, whether they have a 2D software or not, they're out there. Some, some are free, some are not free. Some you can use on a Chromebook, some you can't. So I don't think it's time to get into what's free and what's not free and what you can use in a Chromebook because there's a lot of information out there. With the pandemic, other companies are trying to get uh, allow Chromebooks to drive some of their software. So I'm not the expert at that. I know I have some 2D software that we use here at, at my school and, and it works quite well. There are, there are some free sources out there. So really the key to the communications unit is can we hand sketch and get good at that? Can we do 2D and then can we use a 3D modeling software? Again, there's, there's free 3D modeling software as well and there's modeling software that you have to pay for. So. Again, towards the end, if, if there's really specific questions about that, my email address is at the end and we can have that discussion. But anyway, the, the takeaway here is some schools have 3D printers, some schools do not. Some schools have laser engravers, some schools do not. We were fortunate to have 3D printers and laser engravers. Every image that you see here, the part was modeled up in a software, whether it was 2, 2D or 3D, typically a 3D software and then we can send it to a 3D printer. So these upper right pictures, the, the second image down is a 3D modeled part. That went straight into a 3D printer and then you can see the image at the very top is the result of that 3D printed model from the software that we used. So again, I'm not gonna get into the specific softwares, but there's a lot of them out there and uh, I would encourage you to um, explore and, and look at that. A 3D printer, laser engraver, those are just tools to help make better solutions. If you have them, great, use them. If you don't have them, things to consider later on, but you can function without them uh, if you don't have them. All right. There's not a whole lot about the engineering communication as far as questions. I'm gonna just keep moving ahead. If there's questions about that unit, we can talk about that towards the end. Remember a couple slides ago, I talked about structural engineering and how similar that is to civil engineering. There's two specific units and two different projects that we do for different reasons. There's two activities three actually. Um, we'll do some BALSA testing. So what students are going to end up completing is we're going to get a BALSA sticks. There's a lot of places that you can pick BALSA up. Um, NASCO actually sells it as well, but they're going to put together different 
pieces, sizes, glue some material together, test all these different pieces to see what is strong. So if you look at the upper right image, we have a wireless force sensor. You can use a memory spring scale that uh, NASCO uh, sells. There's a balsa stick here. We're pulling down. We're seeing how much force it takes. This image on the left are different tests that were done with different sized balsa. Why would we do this? The purpose is when students get to the actual balsa bridge, they need to make some decisions. And the decisions are if 1 8 by 1 8 balsa is so many pennies per linear inch and the eighth by quarter is a different amount, what is stronger, going back to this, which material is gonna be stronger? Where am I gonna get the most bang for my dollar? In a theoretical world, students price out what they think their bridge is gonna cost and they're gonna to have to make some decisions based off of their testing that they did. So I'm gonna go back to the to the unit. So when they need to build a bridge, here's some of the parameters that are set. So also bridge building's been done forever. It's been done in elementary school, middle school, high school, college. So it's nothing new that also bridge, this isn't a, a revelation or anything, but what you do with that and the process that you follow is the key. So Couple things about the parameters. There, with the the made-up numbers that are given, they need to create a bridge that can't cost more than ten dollars and fifty cents. Again, this is not the actual cost. It's fractions of what this number would be. Uh, they can't build this bridge higher than seven. It doesn't even make sense to build it higher than seven. It's going to cover a span of twelve inches. So, understanding that the span is the gap. You can't have your bridge 12 inches long to span a 12 inch gap. I say that five times, and there's several students that build a bridge what length? 12 inches, so it's, uh, that's gonna happen. Those things are gonna happen. The width of the bridge has to be at least three inches. The plates that they're gonna test on, I'll go back to the image in a little bit, it has a uh, two and three quarter by two and three quarter uh, square. Here's the materials that they're gonna use, eighth by quarter, eighth by eighth, 16th by three eighths. They can use any type of glue. I supply hot glue and wood glue. Hot glue is super heavy. So the purpose of the bridge is how much weight is the bridge gonna hold as opposed to how much the bridge weighs. So the more hot glue that you squirt on that balsa, the heavier it gets, the more weight it's probably gonna hold, but the ratio isn't gonna be much better. So there's a build report, and then here's the numbers that they're gonna use. So they take their design, and they figure out how much it's gonna cost. Many, many times, students will glue eighth by eighth pieces of balsa together to get to that eighth by quarter, because if you look at this price here, uh, and this price, it's a little bit different, but what students can do is potentially even put three eighth by eighth pieces together and then things get a lot stronger. So again, going back to the structural testing, if done right and they understand what they tested and it's just not an activity that, okay, teacher's making me do this. If they understand why they did this, it is gonna make the ratio or the end result of this much better. So here's a couple examples. This is the plate that I'm talking about and Basically, that gets hooked up to a five-gallon bucket. Sand gets poured in there. Bridge breaks, weigh the bucket of sand, uh, compare that to the weight of the bridge, and, and there's the ratio. What is a good ratio? A good ratio is anywhere from 600 to 1 or higher. That is the A mark. And I'll go into, I'm going to go back to the rubric so that you can kind of see what that would look like. So what would I assess a 
a student on uh, some terminology that they have to do, their sketches, their full sketch. Did they do a cost analysis of it? Do they have a materials list, a parts list? What does their construction of the bridge look like? Is it quality or does it look like they used 10 hot glue sticks and just glued the, the heck out of it? The ratio is, as you can see here, 600 to 1. And sometimes you get that 1 to 200. So um, never give, any, it's hard to get less than 100. And then the build report is also important. So I'm going to jump back here. Um, here's an example that I share with students. This is, I wouldn't say a quality drawing, but at least specific enough that it gives me general information. So I'm going to throw this at you. Go back to that engineering communication unit. What did we talk about? Front, top, right side view. So if you look at this, that engineering communication that we just talked about plays perfectly into this. So here's the front of my bridge and here's the top of my bridge. And I can now look at some sizes. Again, some of the sizes are missing. So this isn't what I would consider a perfect full size sketch, but it's not bad. It's, it's pretty good. And then students have to create a report as well. So you may think like, man, this guy gives a lot of reports, but there is, uh, it, it just allow, allows a teacher to see the process that a student follows. So I'm just going to quickly go through this. Uh, terminology that was done, uh, sketches that were given to me, and we just take pictures and insert them into the, the documentation. Here's the cost analysis. This is a terrible cost analysis. The parts aren't labeled individually. This is a little bit better, but again, not a perfect example. I don't typically show a perfect one because then everyone wants to just mock that. So I give them a okay report, but nothing like out of this world, crazy awesome. Otherwise, that's just all they try to, to replicate. So um, hold off here for a second to see if there's any questions. This one is a much bigger unit as far as time-wise. This is probably uh, eight hours, around you know six to eight hours of by the time they plan and design and build the documentation and build a bridge, test the bridge, and turn their report in six six seven hours. So I'll give about ten seconds for any questions, and then we'll move on. So time-wise, I'm going to try to pick it up a little bit. I'm trying to uh, be respectful of time. So the material science unit is three activities. There's a material analysis. I'm going to just show you kind of what that looks like. A recycled display board. These images down below are recycled display boards that have the seven different recyclable plastics. Students are supposed to find the material and then they will create the molecular structure of that just by um, explaining what it is uh, science-wise. They'll talk about the uses, they'll talk about the different types of material, they'll talk about the uh, how long these Plastics would last in a landfill, which I think most of us know is a long, long, long time. So um, there's a lot of information here. So we have students build this display board. Then they do a quick presentation on it. Make sure we know that they've researched it well enough, deep enough that they understand it. And what is the purpose? Will they all turn into recyclers? No, maybe not. But I think they have a better understanding. So I'm going to talk about the material analysis. Um, Jordan, let me know that things are a little bit lagged when I move into the to the learning management system. So I'll try to let it catch up a little bit so what I'm talking about actually matches. 
Uh, I'm going to just go to the activity of material analysis. And so hopefully you can see what's on my screen. It's the material analysis data sheet. There's the presentation in the, the unit. And I have all of these supplies, materials that I just put out on a table. Students pick them up. They're going to classify it. What type of material is it? What do they think on a scale of one to five? Their stiffness, ductility, brittleness, hardness, elasticity. Do they think it's electric, con uh, conductive electrically or thermally? Uh, do we put electricity to them? No. Do we put a lighter underneath it? No. But I think they can make some educated guesses as to which ones are conductive or not whether it's electrically or thermally. So this chart here could be, if you bought all the supplies from NASCO, this'll, these will be the items that you would get if you have your own supply of things, great. It's really just a matter of get 10 to 15 things, have students grab them, take them, touch them, move them, and make some educated decisions on, and guesses on what they think those characteristics are. Uh, the last activity is a material dissection. I won't get into the details of that. It's really find some sort of component, electronic, non-electronic, some product that students can take apart and break it down into the different materials and characteristics of those materials. So that would also be more of a display board that students would create. Um, Depends on how much time you have in a semester. There's times that I get through I get through the first two activities and then I just don't have enough time to get through the last one. So it's really a matter of how much time and, and content that you can cover. So I'm gonna just keep moving along, save those few seconds for questions till the end. Uh, we're getting there towards the end, so I'm gonna go a little bit quicker. This destructive testing, the paper click, paper clip data. It's really destructive testing paper clips. Why would we do that? Because paper clips are next to nothing, um, very cheap and easy to to use, and you can do it at a, a table. So they'll do ten iterations. They'll take and basically bend large paper clips and small paper clips. As you can see, uh, I just highlighted Alan and Owen. They Bent paper clips, the large ones break before the small ones. Average number uh, that you can see here. So they have to do a little bit of data collection, which is good. They break things. They love that. They're putting that information, comparing it with other students in the class, and then they create a chart. Now, in my opinion, this is a, it's not a very long activity. It's not a, a it's not a project that's going to take you days to do. It's going to take you an hour to get all this data collected and start putting it together. It's going to take another hour to, to put the spreadsheet together and get information from other people. And then I always have students talk about it. So paper clips are not meant to break, uh, to be bent the way we bend them, and that's why they break. So it's really just a, a material and a product that we can use that is super cheap. You can find them in your desk drawer. Cardboard furniture in the design and engineering unit is a project that you would have to do one of two ways. If you have the ability to get and secure a lot of cardboard, full size cardboard furniture is awesome. If you don't have free cardboard somewhere, uh, you probably are going to do quarter scale prototypes of this. It's just not cost effective. If I were to buy all of the cardboard for this table that has doubled up or two pieces of cardboard laminated or glued together and the size of it so it could hold that person of 150 pounds, 
I would probably spend more money than I would want for a, a desk that probably isn't going to be used a whole lot. Um, it's more of the design. So again, I'm going to slow it down a little bit. But the activity, the activity is basically designing a piece of furniture, not a table, not always a chair. I certainly wouldn't suggest a bed or anything like that, but it could if you only do quarter scale stuff. I'm going to show you a quick, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but there is a person that created, Jordan will let me know if this is coming through. Um, so there is a person that, a college student that was going to school for engineering. Um, and it doesn't look like the video is playing as far as Jordan's telling me. So maybe we will skip that. Oh, now it's playing. Um, so as you look at this, some of the designs that students come up with are not always based off of this video, but this is about a 15-minute video, a little longer than 15-minute video that kind of walks through this engineering student's plans and designs. I'd like to just, so he makes little mock-ups. Um, he's got his engineering notebook. Again, I don't know if you'll, you'll see all of this, but uh, that's not the point. So there's many, many different ideas and thoughts that students come up with based off of this video. So I'm going to stop that. Again, this is this is the planning, the designing, testing cardboard. How much do we want it to hold? Is this desk built for this student to sit on? The answer is no. Did this student design it for that? No. So in my opinion, this was, you look at this honeycomb look here on the left, too much cardboard. What's it going to hold? A laptop? Maybe a backpack at 20 pounds, a laptop of 7 pounds. This desk is going to hold less than 50 pounds. It does not need to be designed to hold a student. So in my opinion, this was too much material for the point of use, which is a desk, not a bed or some chair for this student to sit on. Not that it wasn't a cool project, but a um, little overkill. What do you folks know about electricity? So... A lot of people are hesitant to talk about electricity. There's, in the electricity fundamentals, uh, what we talk about, series parallel circuits, Ohm's law, voltage current resistance, all the important things that you would typically see in a science, like a physical science class. But we will talk about it and actually use it and put it into a project much like this STEM operation. So, if you've ever played the STEM operation game, I'm not sure who my audience is and how old we are, but if you think back to STEM operation, there's the, the concept is based off of that game. There's a tweezers that's, get, that's connected to all of this stuff on the right side that has some copper or fabric conductive tape that we will, because we have a 3D printer, we build these 3D printed models and we threw, um, put them inside the little pockets or cavities. And now the students have to go in there and try to grab them out without having the tweezers touch the edge, which is the conductive tape, which then makes a buzzer buzz and the lights light. So the concept is kids like doing this. What do I like? I like making sure kids can do series and parallel circuits and understand it, know what voltage current and resistance is doing. Kids like to, to build it. So a perfect example is students understand series and parallel circuits, but then when they have to put it together, mm, they kind of can't put the theory into practicality. So then there has to be a little bit of re-educating them on what exactly a series and parallel circuit is. Systems. A system it has inputs, process, output, feedback. Students need to design a 
vehicle that has different systems. It's got to have a drivetrain. It has to have a way to trigger a mousetrap. It has to have a way to catch an egg or some some item that's going to fall from a certain distance. So there's a lot to this. It's bringing systems together. I'm not, uh, in essence of time, I'll, I'll not spend a ton of time on this. Um, we do have students make a report. I will. So we're getting, when we get to some of these longer, bigger projects, I expect a little more from students. So as you can see, students have to, again, prove that they followed a process to create their solution. And price things out, their final testing. And again, a reflection. So again, not a great example, but good enough for uh, for students to see so that hopefully they make it a little bit better. We're almost done here. Uh, there's two activities that we do in the packaging units. One is this image here on the left is, can you put a certain number of blocks into a pre-designed uh, box? Students have to draw it out, cut it out, bend it up, tape it up, and they have to figure out the surface area, the volume of 24 blocks, so that 24 blocks fit in here. So that's pattern development. Why do we do that? Because the actual package design, students are supposed to take 10 gumballs, one inch gumballs, and build and design creatively market their gumball packaging. So this upper right picture of the bumble gum is probably one of the better ones that 10 gumballs fit in here. Uh, gumballs come out of the top. The process is here, the different pattern development that had to be done. So there's, and they have to QR code it. They have to give me nutritional information. So just really more of a marketing graphics project in addition to just package design. Very cool, students do a presentation and you know, they're trying to sell it, they're trying to market it. If if this bumble gum was on the shelf at a store as well as this one, which one are you gonna buy? And that's what I make sure kids are aware of. Uh, try to make it as good and, and attractive as possible so that your product is what sells off the shelf, not someone else's.